Way up at the top of the current map of Runeterra, in the northwestern portion of Valoran, we find the Freljord, a tundra nation known for its snow and harsh weather where demigods and tribes wage war with one another, trolls wander, and deadly ice forms some of the most dangerous weapons in the land. But the Freljord also hosts some of the deepest history in Runeterra and is a land almost defined by a constant struggle between conflicting ideologies. Here's everything you need to know about the Freljord in 13 minutes. Like the other videos in this series, this is going to be about the Freljord as a place and setting, what life is like there, what the land is like, creatures and factions you'll encounter, etc. We're going to touch on historical events, particularly because history is crucial to the Freljord, but this isn't going to be a deep dive into every story written about the Freljord. This is Freljord 101, a foundational set of knowledge for you to go and seek out the places you want to learn about on your own. If you're brand new to Runeterra lore, or you're coming from my shorts, there's a bunch of videos in this series already. You should probably start with the intro one that covers the entirety of the Runeterran map, and the timeline found in the first lore book. That was the first video I ever made, so maybe I should remake that video when we're done with all of these. If you like this video, remember to like and subscribe, and leave a comment, maybe tell a friend, all of those help the channel a ton. All right. Let's go get cold. The Freljord, being the northeastern piece of Valoran, borders on what's known as the Ice Sea, and across it is some real icy land claimed by the Ursine clan and the demigod Volibear. Next to that Ice Sea is a long, large mountain range known as the Ridgeback Mountains that stretches the entire northern coast of the Freljord. This is where the main home of the Frost Trolls, aptly named the Frost Troll Village, is. Ghoulfrost, where the League Champion Ash found her true ice bow, is also here. In fact, most of the locations from the Ash comic series War Mother are up here. The tribe that she adopts as the new Avarosans are from a settlement called Kuchar, and Vachkar is where the original Avarosans were from. If we move even more northeast, we arrive at Frostguard Citadel, the stronghold of Lysandra's Frostguard, a castle built to stand guard over the Howling Abyss. This place is also the central location of the closest thing the Freljord has to a library. Frostguard keep the historical records of the land here. This is Lysandra's throne and the epicenter of the religion of the Three Sisters. Next to the citadel is a place known as the Foundling Village, where the Frostguard raises orphans of the Freljord. Orphans like Nunu. Moving south from the citadel, we know this is the region that Hearthhome is in, the home of the great ram demigod Orn. The original Hearthhome also hosted Orn's followers, but was destroyed in a fight with his brother, the Volibear. And now Orn lives in the rebuilt Hearthhome, sheltered from the world. From there, as we move west towards the sea, right smack dab in the center, I guess this is the sort of the center, the center of the Freljord is Rocklestake, a safe haven for the Avarosans that includes a statue of the sister Avarosa herself. Finally, to the west is the Lochfar Peninsula, the original home of Olaf, which features several trader ports and settlements, two of which are Frostheld, the former capital of the Avarosans until it was burnt down by the Demacian fleet, which we talk about a little bit in the Demacia overview video, and Glosserport, an icy port that has a number of Winter's Claw-owned wolf ships currently chained and docked during the winter. Okay, normally we dive into culture and government and all that jazz after we talk about geography, but when it comes to the Freljord, I think we actually have to talk about the spirit gods first, because they're really important to the nation. The spirit gods are forces of nature, deities tied to the land itself whom interact with mortals to varying degrees based basically just on how they feel. In the Freljord, they're basically all represented by animals, although they may appear in other forms at times. There's actually a lot of references to various spirit gods in the Freljord in the form of foxes, lynx, mammoths, elk, and more, usually touched on by various shaman. But that said, there are definitely some spirit gods that are more important than others, and those are the ones we're going to talk about today in no particular order. First up is Orn. He's known as the Great Ram, or Ramharg, god of the forge and hearth, master of fire and magma which, as you can imagine, is a pretty useful power in a land that's perpetually cold. As far as the spirit gods go, Orn is a pretty civilized dude. He's helped the people of the Freljord build things and even at times sheltered them. He's a master craftsman, and tales of Orn talk about how he's the one responsible for shaping the land of the Freljord into what it is today, via very normal things like headbutting mountains or punching valleys. He resides in a place called Hearthhome, and at one point the followers settled around the Hearthhome were called the Hearthblood. They forged things in Orn's honor, and Orn cared for them secretly even though he was outwardly indifferent. But a clash with his brother the Volibear would result in the death of the Hearthblood, an event that made Orn retreat into solitude within a Hearthhome that he rebuilt. Speaking of which, next up is the Volibear. The Great Bear, the God of the Storm, a wild, giant bear who believes firmly in the old, primal ways of the Freljord, which are much more vicious, let's say. 
Bolo Bear does have followers that follow him, known as the Ursine, and honestly, the Ursine aren't just members of their own clan. Ursine Shaman can be found across the Freljord, even as part of the Winter's Claw. Bolo Bear lends his strength to those who call on him when they need it in battle, but has no real affinity for any given tribe outside of the Ursine, as he truly believes the strong should survive. This is why he's lent his aid to Sejuani and Udir in the past, but simultaneously is in conflict with Sejuani right now as she attempts to steal Orn's cauldron back from him, a magical cauldron that can feed people of the Freljord that Vola Bear stole. Next up is Anivia, the Undying Eagle, the Cryo Phoenix, whose domain is ice, wind, and snow, and basically everything the Freljord is known for. In contrast to Vola Bear, Anivia is actually pretty kind to humans, but she's also a devout protector of the Freljord, working with tribes like the Avarosans to unite the Freljord and bring its strength so that it's good against internal and external threats. Nice probably isn't a word I would use to describe any spirit god, but if I had to pick one, Anivia is probably the nicest of the majors. And honorable mention for the spirit gods goes to Ildharg, the Iron Boar, the Wrath of the Freljord, who, as of Udir's new visual update, is represented in League of Legends as one of the four gods that Udir channels into his forms. And the Seal Sister, who I don't have a picture of, so here's my best artist rendition of the Seal Sister. She's present in burial rites and healing, and according to myth is also responsible, along with Orn, for the perpetual snow of the Freljord, caused when she had a river run through his home. She also appeared to Udir and seemingly had a hand in him learning to harness the power of the spirit gods. Do you like D&D barbarian aesthetics mixed with Vikings mixed with cold? Then I have great news, the Freljord is your place to be. The nation is divided into various tribes that are nomadic to a varying degree based on their lifestyles, but they all share commonality in living off the land and in the frigid conditions of the Freljord. Tribes are typically matriarchies led by a war mother, Sejuani and Ash both being good examples as such. These war mothers will have oathbound, which is the closest approximate to marital partners, but oathbound relationships are complicated. You can have more than one oathbound, you may not necessarily be sleeping with all of those oathbound, you may have complex relationships if you're bound with somebody who's also bound to other people. Oathbinding is really about protecting the people you're bound to, more than being constantly romantic with one another. In addition to war mothers, there are other roles that you'll see across tribes. Vedma are a type of warrior seer. Scarthanes are high-level leaders, there are always shaman of varying spirit gods in worship, and notably frost priests, who can be found across the various tribes as healers, but are all technically members of the Frostguard clan, whom Lissandra uses to try and maintain dominance over the Freljord at a religious level. When we think about the tribes of the Freljord, I would describe it as sort of a power triangle between three specific tribes. There are the Avarosans, who are led by Ash, and are generally speaking a more peaceful tribe. That's not to say they aren't powerful from a battle perspective. They are, as their tribe is an amalgamation of many tribes from the Freljord, including Trindamir's Fierce Barbarians. But the Avarosans are looking to try and unite the Freljord as a single tribe, and are less inclined to raid and attack other weaker tribes. They also settle in the warmer regions of the Freljord, and are more likely to engage in agricultural activity, due to both their temperament, as well as the climate that they find themselves in. The original Avarosans were run by Ash's mom Grenna, and were wiped out over the course of Grenna's quest to find the legendary throne of Avarosa. But Ash adopted a clan that was under attack by the Winter's Claw, known as the Ebertal, and made them into the first new Avarosan tribe. The Avarosans host Ash and Trindamir, as previously mentioned, but also include Brom, who Ruined King players will recognize as one of their allies, and have good relations with Anivia. The aforementioned Winter's Claw is the second of our triad, and they're definitely the battle-hungry ones. Led by Sejuani, the Winter's Claw is the definition of the strong will survive, looking to conquer the Freljord. They're closer to the traditional Freljordian lifestyle as nomads who hunt and gather and wage war for survival. That doesn't just mean war with the Freljord either. They're moving south to raid Demacia, they're defending the eastern border from Noxians and raiding those encampments. There's a world where you look at the Winter's Claw and say, these are the true defenders of the Freljord because they want the Freljord to be strong. That strength just sometimes comes at the expense of killing off other tribes. And if you're listening to my description of the Winter's Claw and going, gee Mike, sure sounds like these people would get along with the Vola Bear, you're right. The Ursine have even traditionally been found amongst the Winter's Claw ranks, and the Vola Bear has lent them his strength, in addition to champions such as Udir and Olaf being strong allies. As of the current lore, Sejuani's gone off to steal an Orn Forged Cauldron from the Vola Bear with the intent of using it to keep her people fed, so there's some beef there. But Vola Bear values strength and combat and warriors, and that's really all Sejuani is doing here, so if you ask me, I think ultimately their relationship is probably going to be just fine. Especially because they're united in their goals regarding fighting against our third clan, the Frostguard, Lissandra's cult of personality, the keepers of the Freljordian history, and the weirdos with cool looking armor. The Frostguard basically exists for two reasons. The first is to help Lissandra maintain control of the Freljord, whether through historical manipulation, 
Frost Priest Spies, Military Might, or allying with the Frost Trolls. And the second is to stand guard against the Watchers, the powerful originators of the Void that Lysandra trapped in the Howling Abyss under a ton of true ice. Lysandra sits squarely atop the throne here, plotting to still gain control over the Freljord and eventually all of Runeterra. Also worth noting are the Ursine, whom we've mentioned a bunch as the followers of the Vola Bear, and the Frost Trolls, who are led by the Troll King Trundle. While they're not necessarily part of the three-way power struggle described above, they're both potent factions in their own right. Trundle is an incredibly smart troll leader and a powerful ally for the Frost Guard. And the Ursine are cunning, powerful warriors who literally have a god on their side. When we think about Freljordian architecture, we want to think about stuff that will last through the harsh climates. Lawn houses, huts, things built from natural materials. Clothing is similarly practical, built from leather and other materials you would find amongst animals and creatures of the Freljord. Furs and insulated fabrics are obviously pretty important for survival. From a weaponry perspective, same rules apply. Wood, steel, and bone, created from what they can use and find in the land. But there's one big exception to the rule. True ice is a magical form of ice that can't melt under traditional ice melting circumstances and is deadly to the touch creates incredibly powerful weapons and armor. To most mortals, true ice represents an incredible risk. But the Freljord sports a special type of mortal, known as Iceborn, that can wield true ice to great effect. These Iceborn are particularly resilient to the cold as well, so they don't necessarily need as warm of clothing as their normal mortal counterparts. There are a ton of examples of true ice weaponry and Iceborn. Ash's bow, Trundle's club, Olaf's axes, part of Brahm's shield, even Gragas's beer. There's even a version of it that became corrupted by the void power of the Watchers, known as Dark Ice, with healing and restorative powers, weirdly enough. The true ice imprisoning the Watchers is a good place to find tainted Dark Ice if you're looking for it. The history of the Freljord is deep, but there's some really specific events that you'll want to know about for the purposes of understanding why it is the way that it is today. The first of these events is what's known as the War of the Three Sisters. Back in the ancient times of the Freljord, the three sisters of Lysandra, Sibrilda, and Avarosa rose to power. They began to attempt to control and instill order amongst the Freljord, an idea that the Volobear and some spirit gods opposed, as it went against the old traditions, but that other spirit gods like Anivia were more inclined to agree with. Volibear attempted to recruit Orn to his side of the cause, using him to arm the Ursine, but when Orn refused, the two clashed and Orn's followers wound up wiped out. In the confrontations that ensued, Volibear blinded Lysandra, and as the war raged on, Lysandra reached out in her dreams, and the dreams reached back. The Watchers, the proprietors of the Void, called to Lysandra, and they struck a bargain wherein Lysandra would be granted functional immortality and power, and in return, she would prepare the world for the arrival of the Watchers. This power granted by the Watchers is the origin of how the Iceborn came to be. Tensions grew amongst the sisters as Avarosa and Cyrilda disagreed with the decision to ally with the Watchers, and they marched on Lysandra's fortress. At the same time, the Watchers appeared in Runeterra, and when it became clear that they were a world-ending threat, Lysandra made a decision. She sacrificed her sisters, and all of their armies, to trap the Watchers beneath layers and layers of true ice. Here the Watchers remain, trapped, watched over by the Frost Guard. Lysandra keeping them at bay. The second is the story of Ash's ascension to War Mother of the Avarosans, which is detailed in the comic series War Mother. This reviews how Ash's mom, Grena, was in search of Avarosa's throne, a place of legendary power, the namesake of which being one of the historical three sisters we just discussed. The search for this throne led Ash to her true ice bow, but also resulted in the effective eradication of the existing Avarosan clan. Alone, she found Sejuani, and the two joined together, becoming close friends and then sworn battle sisters. But when Sejuani challenged her own mother for war mothership of the tribe and raided the Ebertal tribe, Ash defended them, and the two became enemies. Sejuani left, and Ash adopted the Ebertal as the new Avarosans, seeking to unite them with the other tribes of the Freljord. This story is sort of a catalyst for the political landscape that we see in the Freljord today. Finally worth noting as well is the most recent Freljord lore concerning Sejuani, which we've already mentioned in this video but bears repeating. As the Winter's Claw have scattered to help increase their odds of survival, Sejuani learned that the legend of Orn's cauldron, a perpetually feeding cauldron, was real and it was in possession of the Ursine, so she marched on Volibear's territory to steal the cauldron back. This is shown in the Call cinematic from League and the fallout of this conflict is currently unclear. I'm stopping our lesson there for the sake of brevity, but honestly, there's so much Freljord info, I don't even know where to begin. Go to the League Universe page and look at all the Freljord stuff. I highly recommend going and reading basically every story about Sejuani, as well as the Volibear ones. They're the ones I personally find extra interesting. But there's a ton of depth in the stories of characters we barely even touched on, like Braum. This might be the first time I've ever finished a video and gone, maybe we're gonna have to come back and do like a, what's a sequel to a 101 class, like a 201 class? We should do a 201 class on the Freljord. Thanks for watching, remember to like and subscribe, see you in the next one.